Go ahead and turn your song book to number 37. We'll be singing that song in just a moment by way of encouragement. Those of you visiting with us tonight, we, uh, we are concluding a series on prayer. We began January the, the first Sunday night in rather February, and we went four lessons. This is our fourth lesson and final lesson. Um, let me get rid of my talk amongst yourself. I had a coughing spell and I put a mint in my mouth. Hmm? I believe I'll be all right once I get rid of this. You getting this on DVD? Should have. By the way, we're gonna, we're have, we've got DVDs coming out, and we're putting them out on Facebook and so forth. We'll, we'll be writing a, a way that you can get on the Internet and go look at the, the lessons, but ignore this part. You're right. <clears throat> Thank you for that. We're going to be finishing up the prayer uh, series tonight. This is our fourth and final lesson. Next week, everybody listen up. Mark this on your calendar. Next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, like we normally worship Sunday evening, we're going to apply what we've learned. We're going to have a prayer night. You know, we have a singing night every fifth Sunday singing here at Liberty. I love that. We could have it every month, but, but we've, we've decided to have it every fifth Sunday singing. So we have a singing night, and we're going to have a prayer night, a worship in prayer night next Sunday evening. Now, those of you that have been able to come and be a part of our prayer meetings uh, that we we've, we've have frequently here at Liberty over the last few years, you already know the format of how we're going to be doing that. Those of you who haven't been able to make it, you're going to get to experience that because you're going to experience being in prayer to God as a group, as a church. And we're going to apply these principles that we've learned in the last few weeks and tonight. So what we'll be having, and I'll introduce this next time, but we'll be having men to come forward. And, of course, they'll all be on the front bench. Guys, listen up. Uh, they've got their assignments already. They're already spread out there, and they've got their assignments. So they got now to next week to pray about it, think about it. But they'll be on the up here, they'll be, they'll be on the benches or whatever, and they'll each come up, there'll be a, a scripture reading, there'll be a prayer, and uh, we'll do that throughout, and, that, and we'll have an entire hour or 35 minutes, whatever we normally have, on, and pray to God, lifting up, whatever it takes. If it takes uh, two or three minutes per prayer, if it takes five or ten minutes per prayer, but we're going to pray to God. We'll try to keep it in the, in the allotted hour, but we're going to pray to God. And we're going to keep these principles that we've learned the last three weeks and tonight in our minds while we are engaging in that group prayer. God's going to be uplifted. He's going to be glorified. And who knows, when we get those prayer bowls, what are 200 prayer bowls going up to, to heaven and the, the smoke rising up, he may scoop up some fire from the altar and there may be some voices, lightning, thunderings, and earthquakes. God may do something on planet Earth for liberty, for you, for the community. We're excited about it. So don't miss next Sunday night. We're going to spend that time in prayer, and it's going to be a great, great experience. So everybody get ready for that. Tonight, we're going to end up and conclude our discussion. Of course, we there's several more things we could talk about, several more prayer principles, but uh, we're going to conclude tonight, and we're going to... Look at the question, what can hinder our prayers? What is it that can hinder our prayers? We have already discussed the necessity of prayer. We need to pray. It's, it's not like, well, you know, if I don't pray, God's still going to act on earth. You know, God, it comes from his word, we, we saw that in the first lesson, that God sometimes will not act unless we're praying. So we need to pray. Uh, to engage God, God will engage on planet earth as a result of prayer. So we need to pray. We then moved and talked about how that Jesus is our intercessor. We can't 
pray to God. To, we, we don't have the capacity. It would be like an ant talking to uh, us. There's no capacity to communicate. We don't have the capacity to communicate to an almighty God. But through Jesus, we can come boldly before God. We talk about how the Holy Spirit makes intercession. And Christ is our intercessor. Without intercession, there is no prayer. There is nothing that can happen between us and God without intercession. So we talked at length about intercession. Then last week, we talked about what can we pray for. And of course, we noted that we can pray for anything. And next week, when we engage in our prayer night, we are going to pray for anything. We're going to ask, lift God up. Of course, we're going to have some, some things that we're going to pray for, some topics. And these gentlemen will come up and they'll pray for these. We'll have a scripture reading about that topic like pray for kings and all that are in authority, and then someone will come up and they'll pray for the government. They'll pray for the, the folks that are in authority. So we'll have that kind of in topics. We can pray for anything. And we pray how, and we talk about how important it is that we, have, uh, that, that, that we can pray for anything and we should pray for, for, for anything if it's in God's will, and we discuss that. Tonight we're going to discuss some things that can hinder our prayer. So I hope you're taking notes. Get you a piece of paper or someplace in your Bible because if we know that these specific things can hinder our prayers, then we want to be aware of these things. We know that Jesus is our intercessor. That's great. We need to be aware of that. We know that we need to pray. That's great. We need to be aware of that. So we need to pray for anything. But we need to know what can, what can hinder our prayers. And the very first thing that we're going to note is Satan. Satan can hinder our prayers. In Daniel, chapter number 10, Daniel chapter number 10, there's a, a story there, an event, where Daniel is praying to God. And the Bible says in Daniel 10, verse number 2, he said, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning, I was crying, I lifted, I poured out my heart for three full weeks. He said, he went on to say how he fasted and, and of course included prayer. He said he lifted up his prayer. So for three full weeks, full weeks, 21 days, Daniel was engaged in prayer and fasting and pouring out his heart to God. But if we skip down to verse number 12 of that same chapter, someone came to Daniel. It's an angel. He said unto me, fear not, Daniel. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Listen to what the, the angelic being said. He said, From the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, from the 21 days ago, what? To chasten thyself before God. You're fasting, you're praying before God. Listen, thy words were heard. We've been listening to you in heaven for 21 days. From the first day you started praying and fasting and pouring your heart out to God. From the first day till this day, for 21 days, we've been hearing your prayers in heaven. He said, and because we've been hearing your prayer for 21 days, I am come for thy word. Because you're praying, God has sent me, this angelic being, as in a response to your prayer. But. Look at verse number 13 if you're there. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. That is an idiom, that's a, that's a clause describing Satan, the, the enemy. He said he stood against me for 21 days. Satan prevented me from responding for 21 days. But lo, Michael, that's the archangel, the chief, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And then he went on to discuss what he wanted to discuss when he got there. Here's the point. When Daniel began praying, there was spiritual warfare going on. And Satan was involved in hindering the, the, the process of prayer and answer to prayer. Now, I realize this is Old Testament. And today we're living under a New Testament, a better covenant. And we have a better intercessor. We have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit that is speaking things that we can't even speak. So we are in a much better position to, to pray to God and to intercess with God and communicate with God through Christ. I grant that. But we don't need to ignore the fact that there, 
is spiritual warfare going on? In the New Testament, under the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12 says this, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, the physical realm, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, there is a spiritual warfare going on that you and I cannot imagine. We can't see it. We can't touch it. We can't uh, observe it. We can't even know about it. But it's happening. And it is happening just as sure as there are angels, as sure as there are demons, as sure as there is a Satan, as sure as there is a God in heaven. There is spiritual warfare going on. So every time, that we bow our heads in prayers and we get on our knees in our prayers and we are communicating with the eternal God through Christ Jesus, do you think Satan is just sitting on the sidelines saying, oh well, when God is about to throw thunderings, lightnings, and, and an earthquake and make action on earth, do you think Satan is just sitting on the sidelines saying, do whatever you want? No, Satan is involved. He doesn't want that prayer to be effective. We know that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Satan don't want that to happen. He doesn't want a a righteous man to avail anything. So he is very much, very active, him and his demons. And I I can't stand up here and tell you what he's doing. I don't have that observable power. I, I can't see beyond this fleshly world that we live in. But I know it's happening. So number one, Satan can hinder our prayers. It's just a thing that we're happy and we could pray to God. God, don't let Satan hinder our prayers. God, uh, Satan, get thee behind me. We could pray those type prayers. God, uh, do not let Satan win the warfare that's going on beyond my, my observable realm. You know, we could pray that type of prayer. Bind Satan. Uh, I, I, I bind Satan when I'm talking to you about healing somebody in the hospital. I ask Satan to be far, far away and and just see what God's going to do about that in the spiritual realm. Here's another thing that can hinder our prayers. It seems quite obvious, but it's the truth. Not praying. If you don't pray, that's certainly a hindrance to your prayers. By not praying. James 4, verse number 2 says, listen class, I'll start it, you finish it. You have not because... You ask not. A lot of folks are saying, oh, I've I've got problems in this area of my life. I've got problems in that area of my life. Is it possible that we're not praying about it? We have not, James says, because we ask not. And we wonder, God, why ain't you helping me? Are you really there? Are Are you involved in my life? Yes, God is really there. But if we're not genuinely praying, And we're not generally taking our knees to God. Daniel prayed for 21 days. Elijah prayed for rain, not once, not twice, not three times. Seven times he prayed before the rain came. And we talked about that. So a lot of times we'll bow our heads in prayer. We'll pay about a 30-second tribute. God, I I got this problem in my life. I hope you can help it. I got to go. And we're not even praying for it. Not really. Not that second time or third time or fifth time. Then we get in our our mode of, well, where's God at? How come I've got all these issues in my life? Because we're really not praying. And that can certainly hinder our prayers. So let's get to praying. And we're going to do that next Sunday night. For 30 minutes to an hour, we're going to pray to God. So we certainly won't be guilty of that one. That will not be a hindrance to us. So be here. The next one, it will hinder our prayers if we ask amiss. And I put quotations around the word amiss. Listen to James chapter number 4, verse number 3. He says, you ask and you receive not. In other words, your prayer is hindered because you ask amiss. Well, what does that mean? James, what do you mean that I'm asking amiss? Here's what he said. That you may consume it upon your lust. The only reason that you're even approaching God is to do your will, to do my will. And a lot of times that's the way we approach our prayers. That's the only prayers that we ever 
offer to God is my will be done. Instead of saying our Father which art in heaven and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Instead of saying that, we say Father which art in heaven, I need my will to be done. We should be, and we've already discussed this in our, in our principles of our prayers of the last few weeks, but we should be praying into God's will. God, what, what are you wanting to accomplish in this area of my life? I'm going through a dark time in my life. Joseph went through dark times in his life, and God accomplished great things through Joseph. So we could be in our prayer, God, what is, it, what is your will in my life? We certainly want to get out of this dark time. We want to get out of this financial burden. We want to get out of this bad situation. And we want somebody to get well. We, we should pray for these things because we can pray for anything. But not to consume it upon our own lust. In other words, I just want I want and not caring at all what God wants. What is God's will in the matter? So when we take God's will out of our prayer, and not including God's will and, and what he's wanting to accomplish, then that can hinder our prayers. Always include God's will. I'm not saying to use it as a crutch or as an excuse. A lot of times when we pray, I hear this a lot. God, so-and-so is in the hospital. I'd really like for him to get, get well, but thy will be done. Well, that's true. We want to pray that thy will be done. But we're almost like we're giving God an out. We're saying, like, well, God, if it be your will, then get him well. So he didn't get well, so that must not have been your will. So that's fine. You're out. You're, you're off the hook, God. Now, I'm not saying praying like that. We're going to pray in faith. We're going to pray not doubting. We're going to see that in a moment. We're going to pray that God can get that person better. But certainly include the spirit of his will, not my will. That's very, very, very important. And then, of course, doubting. That's the next thing. It can hinder our prayers. James chapter 1, still in James, verse 6 and 7, he says this, But let him ask in faith. When we go to God in prayer and we're asking for that sick person to get well, let's believe that God can do something about it. Let him ask in faith. He says, nothing wavering. Don't waffle. Don't say, well, I, I, need, I, I would like God, I can pray for anything. I'm praying for this issue, but I'm going to waffle on it. I'm going to say, well, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't really think you can do it, but, uh, but I'm going to still pray for it. No, when we go to God in prayer, that prayer is hindered. That prayer is hindered before it gets out of, off through the roof. Go to God and say, God, I know you can do this. I know this is a bad situation, but there is no doubt in my mind that you can do it. I'm not, no, I'm not sure you're going to. I'm not sure it's in your will. I'm not sure you will do it, but I know you can do it. And ask God, knowing that he could do something about it. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. You're waffling, driven by the wind and tossed. Listen, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's a hindrance to our prayers. Don't even think you're going to get anything. If you're asking God and in your heart of hearts, you really don't believe you're going to get it. You really don't believe God can even do it. That's going to hinder your prayers. Mark chapter number 11. Verse 22 through 24, he talks about how faith in God. Verily I say unto you that whatsoever you ask, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be you cast into the sea, and will not doubt in your heart, but shall believe those things which ye shall come to pass, you'll have what you ask. Here's his point. It may not be God's will to move a mountain and throw it in the sea. That's, that's tempting God. If you, that's a, but here's the deal. Believe that God could. If God, let me ask this question. If God willed or wanted to move a mountain and throw it in the sea, could he? Absolutely he could. So when we're praying that God will move a mountain in our life, then we should believe that he could. Don't know if he will, but we should believe that he could. He could, if that was in his will and in his purpose. In fact, we need to believe this. This is one of my favorite verses on prayer. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Believe with all of our heart that God can do more than we can even imagine. We can't even think about what God can do. That's how powerful God is. So doubt will hinder our prayers. The next thing is to be seen of men. 
In Matthew chapter number 6, verse 5 and 8, here's what Jesus said. When you pray, thou shalt not be as a hypocrite. This is an actor. Don't be like a hypocrite, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues, in the important places, and maybe even in the corners of the street, the street corners. They love that. Why? That they may be seen by men. So everybody can look at him and say, oh, how, how spiritual he is, how, how religious he is, how holy he is. Verily I say unto you, this is what Jesus said, truly, I want to tell you a truth about that fellow that's just praying to be seen by people. He says, they have their reward. Their reward is a pat on the back. Their reward is men are going to brag on them. That's their reward, and that's all they're going to get. Their prayer to me is hindered because they're just praying to be seen of men. He said, let me give you some advice. When you pray, he said, do this. Go to your closet. And when you shut the door, when, you, when nobody can see you, pray to your Father which is in secret. And thy Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, do we pray just at the dinner table, when everybody's around, just looking, that's what we're going to do. Do we pray to church when we're supposed to get up and lead our prayers? Is the only time that we ever pray is, is in a setting where it's public events? Or do we pray when we're all by ourselves, nobody else around? Do we utter prayers then? If we don't, then that may be indicative that the only reason that we're praying anyway is to be seen by men. Maybe it's my family, maybe it's our spouse. That's what, you know, I just pray when my spouse is around. We're going to pray before we go to bed at night. But do we ever pray when we're by ourselves? That's indicative of someone that's genuinely praying that's beyond being seen by men. It's more of a ceremonial prayer. It's more of a prayer that, that you feel like you just have to do, you know, God is great, God is good, let him thank for our food, you know, amen. Uh, nothing wrong with teaching our children that prayer. But here's the idea. If we're just praying because it's before we eat or before we go to bed or whatever, it's just a ceremonial type thing, let's think seriously about that. And let's pray when, when nobody else is around and we're engaged in prayer. And then this can hinder our prayer is if we're not really humble in our prayer. Luke 18, 9, and, 9 through 14, you remember that's the story where Jesus said two men went up to the temple to pray. That's what they went to do is to pray. Now, one guy said, oh, God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like other men. You know, that I'm not like a sinners out there that are extortioners and, and all this other stuff. I'm me. You know, I'm me. I pray. I, I fast. I, I do all these great stuff. And then Jesus said there was another fellow that was praying, and he wouldn't so much as even look up into heaven, and he smote his breast which is a, 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 a Jewish way of, of humility. And he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. I confess the fact that I'm a sinner. I, he humbled himself. Jesus said, I tell you something. When those two men left that temple, that place of prayer, one person's prayer was very hindered. It didn't get past the ceiling because of his lack of humility, his arrogance. That guy, who prayed humbly, he went to his home and he was justified. That means I answered his prayer. I heard his prayer. I responded to his prayer. Another thing that hinders our prayer is general sin in our life. If I have sin, now we all sin and we come short of the glory of God, that's a fact. But if I have unrepentant, unconfessed, un uh, I'm not even sorry for it. I've got that kind of sin in my life. That could very well hinder my prayer. Here's what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 7. He says, husbands, love your wives, honor your wives. Now that's a principle, a Christian principle. If a husband does not love and honor and respect his wife, then he is sinning. He's not doing what God would have him do. When, he, when Peter made that comment, 
when he says, when you sow sin that you, that you don't honor your, your wife or love your wife, he says, you need to honor and love your wife. Listen, that, why? Your prayers be not hindered. When you are involved in a sin, in this case, it's the sin of not loving and honoring your wife. But it could be any general sin, any sin. When you're involved in sin, your prayers can be hindered. So if we have a sin in our life that's unrepentant, between now and next week, you need to repent of that sin. Confess that sin. If you need to do it privately, certainly do it privately. But if you need to do it publicly, because everybody knows, you know, and you've brought shame and reproach on the church, you need to come forward and you need to confess that sin and admit that sin and ask God to forgive you of that sin. Repent of that sin. Get rid of that sin. Because your, your, the sin could hinder your prayer. So that your prayers be not hindered. You know, Job, when he was going through his problems, and those three friends that were working with him, and they were doing wrong. At the very end, God accepted Job's prayer, Job's prayer, but he rejected the three friends' prayer. And why? He said, because they didn't speak what's right concerning God. They were in the error with their doctrine, with their thought processes, with their blaming of Job. They were in error, and God said, I'm not listening to your prayer. And in fact, you need to have Job pray for you because Job found out what's right, and he put his hand over his mouth, and he confessed his sin. That's the prayer that I'll listen to. And finally, no act. It will hinder our prayers if we do not take action and follow up. In Exodus chapter 14, Moses had just gotten the people out of Egyptian bondage through the power of God. And as they were escaping from the Egyptians, they got to the Red Sea. And of course, the Red Sea was, a, was an impassable boundary. And here comes the Egyptian soldiers. God held them off with, with his power. He held them off for a while. But here they were. Struck between, stuck between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. They didn't have anywhere to go. And they began to pray to God. And Moses come up and prayed to God. And here's what God said. Why criest thou to me? Go forward. Why are you still praying? I've done all this for you. Ten plagues of... of done all the power, I've shown all my power, you're running into, I've told you that you're going to get to go away from the Egyptians, I've told you that you're going to get to go to Mount Sinai, I told Moses before I even sent him that he's going to bring them all back to this mountain, I've already got that all planned out, why are you still praying, why are you still asking me to, to take care of you, let me tell you, it's time for you to march forward, just go forward, and then of course he opened the Red Sea and they went forward. Sometimes our prayers are hindered because we're still asking for the same thing without ever making a move to correct it. God, help me with a relationship with my wife. God, help me with a relationship with my wife. God, this is her birthday, so I can, amen. I got her a present, so. God, help me with a relationship with my wife. And two weeks later, God, help me with a relationship with my wife. God may be saying, why are you still praying to me? Go forward. Kiss her. Tell her you love her. Do something, you know, kind of work with her, love her, respect her, honor her, whatever. Many times we're constantly asking God, God this, God that, God this, God that. And God saying, why are you still praying? You're taking no action. I've already set the thing in motion. You've asked me to, to help you in this area. I've already paved the way. But you've got to take the footsteps and go through that path. You've got to go through that Red Sea. You've got to move on. Why are you crying to me? Go forward. And that will hinder your prayers every time. Asking God for something that you've asked him for a million times and never took any action. God, help me to be a, to know the Bible more. Help me to know your word. And God's saying, why are you crying to me? Read your Bible. 
read the Bible. I've already paved the way. I've given you a Bible. I've, 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 I've helped you and gave you opportunities to, to go to Bible class. I, I've given you all these opportunities, and you're not taking advantage of any of them. Why are you crying to me? Go forward. Before we finish our series on prayer, I'll just touch on one thing. What can enhance your prayer? These are things that can hinder our prayer, these eight things that are on your list. But we're going to look at one thing that I believe that can actually enhance your prayer, other than the fact, instead of doubting, have faith. That will enhance your prayer. Instead of uh, not being humble, you know, be humble. That will enhance your prayer. All the things that hinder your prayers, and my prayers, if we turn it around and do the opposite, then that will enhance our prayers. But there's one thing that we just got to mention for about one minute, and that is fasting. We're not going to go into detail on fasting. On, write this date down if you're interested in getting a copy of a CD, if we have a copy of it from here. May the 6th, 2013, we brought a lesson from this pulpit uh, about fasting, an entire 30-minute lesson on fasting. And uh, we talked about the importance of fasting. And, and people say, well, you know, they did that in the Old Testament. And they did. They certainly did that. In the, David fasted. Joel fasted. Zechariah fasted. A lot of people fasted. You say, they don't do that in the New Testament. Yes, they did. They certainly did. In Corinthians, Paul said, defraud you not one another except be free of consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. So Paul said, fast. He also said uh, in, in 2 Corinthians that he himself fasts on two different occasions. And he was a first century Christian. He was under the new covenant. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, speaking about the work going on in Antioch, which is a first century Christian New Testament church, he says they ministered to the Lord and they fasted. The first century church fasted. And we get the other scriptures of, of, of first century Christians, New Testament Christians, fasting. In fact, next week, when we come together to pray, if you can, now this is not something that God said you must do or you're going to go to hell. Never, in, anywhere in the New Testament did, did, did he say you got to do it. But if you can, and you're healthy enough, and it, uh, if you can skip a meal, skip breakfast, skip a lunch, and just fast. Uh, you don't have to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, you fast for six hours. Uh, a lot of people fast. You, did you know that you, you fast every night? When you go to bed at night, when you get up in the next morning, you eat a meal. What do you call that meal, class? Breakfast. B-R-E-A-K-F-A-S-T. Break fast. That's what breakfast is. You broke your fast where you didn't eat all night, the night before. It's a break fast. So just skip a meal. And maybe next week before you come, maybe skip your breakfast, skip your lunch, uh, skip your supper, whatever. Or if you can physically do that, healthily do that, don't hurt your health. People that get sugar problems and all that. But fasting is, is certainly uh, an, a very important part, something for us to study. Jesus himself, he said, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. He didn't say if you pray, if you give, if you fast. He said, when you do it. So Jesus himself talked seriously about fasting. So what should the sinner do? Can a sinner pray? Can a sinner pray? Well, Cornelius was an alien sinner. And he prayed to God. And he was not a Christian. And God said, your prayers have come up to me for a memorial. I've heard your prayer. God can hear anything. Somebody said, well, God heareth not the prayers of a sinner. Well, that was a, a, a lame man who was healed, made that comment. We won't go into that detail. But God can hear anything. He can hear everybody. But will he respond? When Cornelius prayed, who was an alien sinner who was in his sins, God didn't forgive him of his sins. He said, send to Joppa. There's a fellow there named Peter. Ask him to come, and he will tell you words whereby you shall be saved. So I hear your prayer, and I'm going to give you an opportunity, Cornelius, to be saved. But I'm not going to save you just because you pray to me. I'm not going to save you. 
the Ethiopian eunuch was reading his Bible. There's no doubt he's a prayerful person. And he sent Philip to tell him what to do to be saved. Paul, he was praying and fasting for three days after meeting Jesus himself on the road to Damascus. But yet, it was Ananias that had to come and tell him words, what to do to be saved before Paul would, could be saved. So no sinner can say, Lord God, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I give you my life. No sinner can do that. Nobody who is outside of Christ, I should say. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. But if you're outside of Christ and you're an unsaved individual, praying to God, asking him to come to your heart, that's not what God will. That's not what God will do. Now, God will say, all right, you're praying. You want to know what to do to be saved? You want to get right with me? You want to be in relationship with me? Go forward. Do something about it. And I've got just the thing you need to do about it. You need to hear the word of God. You need to believe the word of God. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess that Jesus is the only living God. You need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And you need to live faithfully. Let me tell you something, sinner. If you will follow me, if you will go forward, then I'll save you. So a sinner, does God hear the prayers of a sinner? Oh, he hears everything. But he won't respond to the prayers of a sinner to save that sinner until he obeys the gospel. So God will open doors for you, but you've got to walk through those doors. If you're here tonight and you need to be, become a Christian, you can pray and pray and pray and pray. And God may be saying to you, why criest thou to me? I've given you so many opportunities. Go forward. So why don't you come forward while together we stand and sing?